Say, this is God's holy word, inspired by the Holy Spirit. I receive it as God's word. It'll be preached in power. It'll bring change to my life. It'll ignite a new flame in me to be and do what God expects from me. Supernatural release of the Spirit. Right, it says, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, now and we know Ahab was a very wicked king, As the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand. Now, maybe we should just keep our place there. We're going to turn to and throw in the Bible. Go to Zechariah, there in the back of the Old Testament, chapter 3. Then we come back to 1 Kings. Zechariah. I don't know what it is in your language, but in English is Zechariah. Get me a music stand for the Bible, then I don't have to walk with the thing. Okay, the Holy Bible. <clears throat> okay, are you ready? He says, and he showed me Joshua, this is Zechariah chapter 3, and he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord. Okay, he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord. Verse 3, now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood by, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused your iniquity to pass from you, and I will clothe you with chains of raiment. And I said, Let them set a fair mitre upon his head. So, that, so they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments, and the angel of the Lord stood by. And the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways, and if you will keep my charge, you shall judge my house, shall keep my court, and I will give you places to walk amongst these that stand by. Okay, now listen to this. This is years after Elijah, and God is speaking to Joshua the high priest through the prophet Zechariah, and he says, if you walk in my ways, if you keep what I have told you to do, I will give you the opportunity to come walk with these that are standing in front of me. So here comes Elijah, and he says to Ahab, the Lord before whom I stand. Okay, I want somebody to just get the Bible. In other words, Elijah walked in God's ways. Elijah was walking pleasing in the sight of the Most High God. Elijah was keeping the commandments of God. He was not one step out because he had the boldness to say to Ahab, the Lord before whom I stand. So if we go to Zechariah, there is Joshua right in the very presence of the Most High God. And God says, if you will now go back out of the spiritual thing that you've been caught up in, if you'll keep my ways and keep my charge and walk in them, I will give you the opportunity to come stand here. So Elijah already stood there. So I just want you to know with whom we have to deal here. This is not some Mickey Mouse peanut head guy. This guy is walking the ways of the Almighty God. He's fearing God. God is pleased with him. All right. He says, uh, before whom I stand, there shall be no dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, get hence, turn eastward, Hide yourself by the brook Cherith. Verse 7, And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up, because there had been no rain in the land. Verse 8, And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath. Okay, so a few things tonight on Elijah's life story. Okay, he said, The Lord before whom I stand. In other words, Elijah lived, heard from inside the secret place. God's dwelling place. 
Remember, this is Old Testament. The Holy of Holies. The Most Holy. Okay? The Most Holy. And because of being there, he could hear the word of the Lord. Okay? The word of the Lord came to him. Okay, now, imagine, I think it was Sunday. I don't know, when, when did I speak on Samuel? Is it Saturday, Sunday? Okay, because nobody knows, I just go on. But somewhere during the weekend, I spoke on Samuel. And the Bible says, when Samuel, when the, you know, before the lamp of God went out and Eli was so dull of hearing and so, you know, he couldn't see anymore. His sight was so dim, you know, because he was so carnal because of his sons and everything. And the Bible says, and when the darkness came, Samuel went in where the ark of the Lord was. In other words, Samuel went in where nobody was allowed to go in except the high priest once here. Samuel went right behind the veil into the very secret place. No wonder he could hear the word of the Lord. The Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 3, visions was very scarce and the word of the Lord was rare in the days of Samuel. So nobody heard from God. Nobody saw anything from God. But when Samuel crept in behind the veil, bam, Samuel... Samuel. I mean, you will hear the voice of the Lord if you come into the secret place. God speaks there 24 hours a day. I mean, there's lightning bolts, there's rainbows, there's fire, there's lamps, there's woohoo. I mean, everything, there's, there's a lot of commotion around the throne. So when Samuel went in there, Samuel, Samuel. And the Bible says, and the word of the Lord came to Samuel again and again. And the word of the Lord was revealed unto Samuel. And the word of the Lord came unto Samuel. And the Bible says, not one of Samuel's words fell to the ground because the word came from the Lord. Okay? So now, so what am I trying to say? Elijah must have been there where Samuel was. You know, I mean, so right through the Old Testament, we have people that went right in where nobody was allowed to. God said nobody can come in here. Yet we can go through the Bible and get one after the other men and women of God that just step right into the presence of God and say, the God before whom I stand. God says, man, I'm well pleased with you. I'm going to speak to you. And the word of the Lord came and the word of the Lord came. Okay, so the word of the Lord came to him and said, go tell Ahab no rain. Tell Ahab no rain. The word of the Lord came and said, go to the brook Cherith. Uh, I'm going to get the ravens to feed you. After a while, the brook dried up. The ravens doesn't come. And the word of the Lord came unto him. Man, the word came. And the word came. And the word came. And every time the word came, there was action on the side of Elijah. Man, he moved to where God was saying. And this is Deuteronomy 8 verse 3, which Jesus quoted when Satan was tempting him in the desert. In Matthew chapter 4 and in Luke chapter 4, when Satan said, turn these stones into bread, and Jesus said, it is written, quoting from Deuteronomy 8 verse 3, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceed, for those who never heard those messages. So, the ravens brought him bread. All of a sudden, there's no more water in the brook so the ravens will not come to get their water so they will not bring their bread so god says man shall not live by bread but by every word that proceed so every time a fresh word came elijah had to act go to the brook go to the widow at zarephath go and every time to another place and every time god is prepared so man live by the word man live by the word man live where did he get the word inside the secret place inside the dwelling place inside the holy of holies inside the most holy so if we want to have the word of the lord we got to go to where god dwells i mean i know god dwells with us i know god dwells within us but yet hebrews 4 and hebrews 10 says we can come boldly to the throne of grace we must still go and pray we must still seek the face of the lord and we must still get this thing to not fall flat okay Amen. <laughs> okay all right I'm trying to be serious it's wednesday night and you know you know how you feel on a wednesday night okay so 
Verse 8, and the word of the Lord came unto him and said, Rise, go to Zarephath. And we know what happened there. This widow, her stuff just multiplied. Verse 17, and it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick, and his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. And she said unto Elijah, What have I done with you, O you man of God? Are you come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? This is Elijah, here's this woman, her son now just died. The first thing is, what sin have I done? Okay, what does it remind you of? John 9, remember Jesus come with the disciples and there's this man born blind. And immediately the disciples said, who sinned, who or he or his parents, that he should be born blind? Jesus said, it's not a matter of who sinned, it's a matter of can we have the power of God available. So I have come not to find out what this man has done wrong, I have come to find out what can I do for you. And I want to help you. If we want to come into the secret place, if we want to stand before God, if we want to hear the word of the Lord, your sin mustn't stand in front of you like a looming giant in intimidating you. The grace of God must be there. The mercy of God must be there. You must see the crucified Christ that opened a door for you to go in and getting there. Remember what happened to Zechariah chapter 3. The minute he stood in front of God, God says, take his sin away. Give him new clothes. Give him new sin. Tell him, I'm, I, you know, he didn't ask for it. You know, he didn't ask, he stood there guilty. And God is there, he's a gracious God, he's a merciful God. And if the, if the, if the church can just learn a little bit more about God's grace, woo -hoo -hoo. I mean, I've been teaching it for years now. What sin have I done? Now the man of God is here, my son is dead, now he's going to tell me you know what I did wrong. He didn't fall, but I'd love it to fall. Uh, how many times do things go wrong in your life or things doesn't work out in your life? And the first question that comes up is, what did I do wrong? Uh, after all the teaching, people still phone me every day. There's my cell phone. You can go check it out. You know, Kubis, you know, this is happening. What do you think I'm doing wrong? I said, what are you doing now? What you're doing wrong is what you're doing now. You're asking the wrong question. You must say, Kubis, would you help pray for me that I get my breakthrough? Don't ask what you've done wrong that is putting you back outside the sanctuary, that is taking you out of the secret place, it's taking you out of the most holy place. If you step in by the blood, if you step in through the veil which is his flesh, the minute you come there, God says, take the dirty clothes away. Take your sin away. Tell him I've paid the price, it's clean. If it could happen in the old Testament, how much more in the New Testament? Mm. Well, I tell you, you know, I, I've just got scriptures tonight. May God help us just as we go on here tonight. Mm. And he said unto her, Give me your son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up into a loft where he abode and laid him upon his own bed. Why would he take him there? Because that's a place where he's comfortable, where he know God speaks to him. Okay, verse 20, and he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, as you also brought evil upon this widow with whom I sojourn, and he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord. Everybody said he cried unto the Lord, <laughs> cried unto the Lord. Listen, and he said, O Lord my God, I pray you, let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. Hmm? Wow, and the woman said, verse 23, now I know that you are a man of God and the word of the Lord is in your mouth. Wow, man. Elijah prayed and God heard his voice. Everybody in the house say, oh God, let my voice be heard in heaven. Let my voice be heard in the Holy of Holies. Let my voice be heard in the secret place. Oh God, let my voice come before you and let it be sweet in your ears. In Jesus' name. Oh man. Mm -hmm. Verse 18. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah. I hope somebody's with me. In the third year saying, go show yourself unto Ahab and I will send rain upon the earth. Now you must know for three and a half years, no rain. No rain. 
Why? Because Elijah said there will be no rain except on my word. Now this woman said, well, I know now that the word of the Lord is in your mouth. So after three years, here comes the word of the Lord. So where does the word of the Lord come? So where was Elijah? Busy with God. What was he doing? How are you busy with God? We call it, thank you. Okay, so Elijah is busy with God. He's in the secret place. And the word of the Lord came saying, hey, Elijah, go join yourself to that. Go sell that man. Go do that. Elijah, go to Zerapath. Elijah, go to the brook. Elijah, go show yourself to Ahab, and I'm going to give rain. So Elijah got up immediately. Okay, so he found Obadiah, verse 7. And as Obadiah was in the way, behold, Elijah met him. Now, Obadiah was the, the, the head of the king's house, you know. And, uh, and, and he knew him, and he fell on his face and said, Are you my Lord Elijah? And he answered, him, I am. Go tell your Lord, behold, Elijah is here. And he said, What have I sinned? <laughs> okay. That you would deliver your servant to the end of the Ahab. Say, I'm going to get rid of the sin question. Get rid of the sin question. And do what? Get a hold of the grace of the Almighty God. Come on, people, tonight. Say, Lord, I'm getting rid of this sin question tonight. I'm going to go for the grace of Almighty God. I'm not going to beat myself with a rod about what I did wrong. I'm going to look at what Jesus did right. The cro okay, come, say it. Say the cross is positive. Did you see it's positive? Oh, please say, the cross is positive. <laughs> Let the word fall on fruitful ground, my Father. Let there be a drawing power that will be so great, so awesome. What have I sinned? Hmm? He says, uh, and now you say, go tell your Lord, verse 11, behold, Elijah is here. And it shall come to pass as soon as I am gone from you, that the Spirit of the Lord shall carry you whether I know not. Okay, I don't know how far we're going to get with this message. I'm just reading. But Obadiah was used to the fact that Elijah used spiritual traveling. It's not foreign in the Word of God. Remember when, when, when Elisha came from the Jordan River after he got the double portion and he picked up Elijah's mantle. Remember the 50 sons of the prophets? They said, where is your Lord? They saw the whole happening, and they took a search party, and they said, we know Elijah. The Spirit of the Lord must have picked him up and dropped him at another place. So they had a search party knowing this man was so involved with God's secret place that God could just lift him up, translate him, put him in another place. Okay? New Testament. Come on, Philip, in Acts chapter 8, I want to entice you and I want to get you ready for the Word of God. Philip, in, in Acts chapter 8, remember when he joined himself to the chariot there in the Gaza Desert? Remember? And, and you know this guy was busy reading out of the prophet Isaiah, you know, he was led as a lamb to the slaughter and he opened not his mouth. And, uh, and God said to Philip, join yourself to the chariot, jump on the chariot. And you know, and this guy said, of who is the writer writing, of himself or somebody else? And he said, and from that point, Philip started explaining to him the gospel of Jesus Christ. And all of a sudden he says, water, you know, what, what hinders me to be baptized? He said, if you believe. So they both stepped down in the water. Philip says, in the name of the Lord Jesus, bam. And when he came up out of the water, where's Philip? And they found him in Asdot. Bam! Translated by the Spirit of the Almighty God. I mean, I prophesy the time's going to come where we will be so busy doing things for God that God will just lift us up, put us there, do stuff, bring us back. Okay? But it can only happen if we live there. The God before whom I stand. And the Word came. And the Word came. And the Word came. Oh, and the Word was scarce in the days of Samuel. But Samuel went in behind the veil where the ark of the Lord was. And God came with the Word of the Lord and revealed Himself. Come on, I hope you're getting ready to just spend some time in the secret place of the Most High God. Hmm? Verse 14. Now you say, go tell your Lord, behold, Elijah is here and he shall slay me. Elijah said, as sure as the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand. 
I will surely show myself unto you. So Elijah says, man, I'm standing before God, man. The commandments I get, I get directly from the secret place. I'm there where the cherubims are. I'm there where the rainbows are. I'm there where the seven lamps are burning. I'm there where the fiery eyes are. I'm there where the hair is as white as wool. I'm there where the feet are bronze burning in the fire. I'm there where golden girdles are. I'm there where God says, I am. Wow, man. So Ahab came and when he saw Elijah, verse 17, he said, are you the one that troubled Israel? And he said, no, I have not troubled Israel. It's you and your house, man. You are following Balaam. You know, you know what Balaam was, a fortune teller. Verse 19, now therefore send and gather me all Israel, not one or two, get me the whole bunch, man, unto Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal, 450 the prophets of the groves, 400, and others, 850 prophets, which eat at Jezebel's table. So now Jezebel was a wicked witch. Married to the sorcerer Ahab, following the ways of the fortune teller Balaam. What a lot of wicked witches together. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, uh, huh? Yeah, it's good stuff, man. So Ahab sent all, all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt you between two opinions? Why, why are you double-minded? In other words, where is your faith? In other words, why don't you believe? Remember, he that goes to God, James 1 verse 7, must ask in faith. Because a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Israel, you are unstable. Then you are following this doctrine. Then you are following that doctrine. Why are you so unstable? Why are you double-minded? Why don't you set your face on God? Why don't you seek the God for, for God Almighty for a change? They didn't know. If God is God, follow him. If Baal is God, will follow him. The people answered him not a word. Now we know the story. Elijah said, this is how we're going to do it. Let the priests of Baal get, the, you know, this bullock and let's put them on an altar and they're going to pray to their God. And I'm going to have a bullock and I'm going to put it on the altar and I'm going to pray to God. And the God that answers by fire, let him be God. How far are we prepared to challenge the world on their doctrines? I mean, how far are we prepared to stick out our heads? I mean, the world doesn't do it. There we have it with Mugabe and Mbeki. I mean, that guy is so wicked. What did he do to, to Mbeki? Nothing. He can't give him anything. He can't bless our country. And when everybody is against Mugabe, Mbeki stands up and said, there's no crisis in, in Zimbabwe. He lost all the favor he had. Now the newspapers, front pages, are Zuma. So he jumped into the gap. He said, I call all African leaders to stand up against Mugabe. So what's going to happen? Zuma is just pushed right to the front because he sees the gap. You know? But what about Christian leaders? What about us? You know, will we compromise or will we stand up and say, hey, there's a God that can answer by fire. Are we prepared to put out a challenge for a change, you know? Or are we intimidated by political systems? I mean, uh, I mean, the, 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 the spiritual atmosphere in this country came in because of two men. First, Andrew Murray in the 1800s and 90s, and the second by John G. Lake in 1908. This is the only two people that brought the spiritual atmosphere into this country. The others just followed. But Andrew Murray had this great revivals in the Dutch Reformed Church, and John G. Lake came in with Thomas Esmolach, and they started the AFM Church in this country. But John G. Lake went to the healing waters in Lourdes in France. And he said, I challenge all the priests, I challenge all the fortune tellers, bring them all, and the God that heals, let him be God. Yeah. Now, he challenged, he hired the city halls and said, bring the fortune tellers, the hypnotists, bring the spiritists, bring them all. So the spiritists sat there, the crystal ball leaders sat there, and everybody was sitting there. And John G. Lake said, right, bring us five of the most deformed cripples in the city. Spiritists, your turn, go. Fortune tellers, your turn. Crystal ball readers, your turn. Roman Catholic priest with your holy water, your turn. You with your healing waters, your turn. When everybody was finished, this is my turn. So John Gillette went, first one up, second one up, third one up, fourth. Only the last one didn't get healed that died shortly afterwards. But four out of the five deformed cripples got healed by the challenge. You know, so 
uh, 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 I'm prophesying again. The time is here when the people of God will once again challenge the world. Up till now, we had the world challenging us. You know, they said, uh, they came and said, with our TV cross, prove us the sick, and they brought their cripples. But we're going to say, bring your cripples. And I'm sure this is what God's going to honor in these days. I did it before. I did it before. I'll do it again in the name of the Lord Jesus, okay? So we know that they were busy all day long, men, and they were screaming. They were crying to Almighty God, oh, God, do this, oh, God, do that. Verse 27. And it came to pass at noon. Okay, just, you know you know who's in your company. We're not mamparas, you know. We're not quasis, okay. I, I was 28 in the mission field, okay. I wasn't, I wasn't born saved. You know, I was done. He had to labor on my soul for three years before I got saved. And, uh, but that's a couple of sizes ago. But Don was faithful in coming every Sunday, praying for me, taking me to church and trying to get me saved and, you know, get me free from cigarettes and stuff. But eventually it happened. <laughs> Thank you, Don. <laughs> and, uh, he studied for a pastor that, uh, those days, bless you, man. But in any case, so we went to the mission field, you know. And in the mission field, I landed up amongst the Hindus. And every night they had these trees with stones around it and these long flags, you know, for the blood-eating monster and for the, you know, this. <laughs> yeah, it is. They have like 12 different flags with different colors and everyone's for another spirit and the one is for this and one. So at 6 o'clock... They get totally possessed. They're out of their clothes. They run around those stones. They have their lamps that they burn, and they take stuff, and they offer incense there on the little temples. Oh, what is it? My goodness, what on earth? Where did I? How did I get here? You know? So we pitched our tent, and the very first night, you know, I just heard a commotion outside the tent, and we had like six people coming to the tent. 2,000 seater tent, six people rocked up. What a revival. And, uh, you know, how many people are prepared to start that way? So we had this big tent up next to the Asocha River there. Six people attended and a big commotion outside. There's more people outside in the car than inside in the tent. And they got this little short demon-possessed Indian girl there. Spit like a snake, a head flat like a snake, fall on the ground, say like a serpent. I know you're very brave, but I shouted, I'm scared. <laughs> I was so scared, I could have wet myself right there on the spot. I was scared. I mean, here's the lady, her face flat, like a cobra. Then she spits like a snake, and she doesn't miss, you know. <laughs> true, true. We've got the slides to prove it to you. So uh, I started quoting scriptures, the few that I knew. You know, like I knew, I knew a few scriptures in James and I knew a few scriptures in Ephesians. And she started quoting them faster than me. And she quoted out of James that the devil believe. Say, we believe. We believe. We know the scriptures. We know all the scriptures. We even quoted them to Jesus. No, brother, he misquoted. No, he didn't misquote. He quoted the scriptures to Jesus. Come on, that's a shocker to a few people. Also, you know, the devil twisted the scripture. He didn't twist it. He quoted them. You know, he said it is written. It was written like that. But Jesus said this is a temptation. This is not for the glory of Almighty God. So I'm scared. I'm scared. I'm really scared. So at last, they took the girl away and took her home. Whew, now I've got to preach to the six that attended the church. So I'm, <laughs> I'm shaken up. But, you know, I got a good word. I had a little booklet from Kenneth Copeland, so I preached the sermon. Uh, <laughs> Kenneth Copeland's sermon, a small little booklet, so I preached Kenneth Copeland's sermon. I was very happy to preach it. And at the end, you know, the father of this girl was waiting outside the tent, said, are you going to come deliver my girl tonight? I said, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and all of a sudden, something took hold of me and said, Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. 
all of a sudden, I heard what I read about John G. Lake, how he challenged the people. Man, I walked into that house that night. Walking into the house, the whole house was full of Bible pages. She got hold of a Bible and she tore all the pages and threw it in the We came into the room and there's this girl. You know what levitation is? She's floating in the air. She's in, she's in the air. Hey. No, I'm not scared. <laughs> I'm not scared. I said, in Jesus, she fell to the floor and the next minute she's out of her bed against the ceiling so hard that some of her hair stuck to the ceiling and she put bam on the floor. <laughs> am I going to be scared? Am I going to know who I am? Where am I dwelling? And on the inside, my spirit cried out and I walked. I'm not showing this devil I'm scared. But on, on the inside, my whole heart is doing this. But there's something else that says, you can do it. I walked over to her, I put my hand on her, I said, in the name of the Lord Jesus. And she started cursing, and I started just speaking the word of the Lord over her. And I said, the blood of Jesus, the name of Jesus. And God said, you need authority. And she cried out, bring me a cat, bring me a dog, I need a body. You know? And I said to Annalise, where's your cat? We had a little cat that <laughs> was always with us. She said, leave my cat. I'm not giving my cat to the devil. And I thought of the pigs, you know, that Jesus cast the devil into the pigs, I said, cat, let the cat scream into the ocean. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I heard, and the word of the Lord came. The visions were very scarce, and the word was rare. And I, I said, out loud, God, give me then a vision and give me a word. I remember it so clearly. And I knelt on my knees, I said, give me a vision. Bam. I saw this girl, age five years old. I saw her playing at a brickyard among some Zulu girls. And I saw her playing with this big mask and they were doing this ritual. And I saw how the Zulu woman was sitting inside casting spells on this and she was a witch doctor. And I saw how this little girl got demon possessed and a little cousin was with her and he was a little small, he was about one or two years old. And I saw how the demon jumped and I said it, I said, I see you five years old playing at a brickyard. I see a Zulu woman, witch doctor, and she screamed, no! I said, yes, the word of the Lord just came to me. And I said, and I didn't give her a chance. I just put my hands on her head and I said, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And while she was still cursing, the next minute she said, re pa so pro she ka cha ma. Filled with the Spirit. You know what? We baptized her the next day. But the next night I stood up. I said, I challenge all Indian gods. I challenge all Hindu gods. I said, bring me the blind and we'll have a challenge here tonight. We had a challenge. They brought people with cancerous sores on their heads and the sores fell off in front of everybody. I was 28 years old. And just this scripture, I took the challenge out of uh, reading the book of John G. Lake, you know, the God, man, spiritual hunger. I said, I'm gonna take the challenge. And, and, and so, uh, so it was, <laughs> sorry, I'm far away now. But, but it's the e time of the evening sacrifice. These people have it all day to pray, Elijah said. It's our turn now. Come on, say, it's our turn now. Come on, church. Say, it's our turn now. It's our turn now. We are the proof producers. We are the sign workers. We are the miracle doers. Come on, people. And it came to pass at noon, verse 27, that Elijah mocked them and said, cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he's talking or he's pursuing or he's in a, in a journey or peradventure he sleeps. Okay, come on, man. See Elijah mocking them. Must be awakened. What do the church do? They shrink back when the world mocks. Come on, it's time to stand up. If they mock us, we must put something in the newspapers. I just wrote it down this weekend. I said the class door record for the next three to four weeks, we must put a full, full page advert on. Come see how God does miracles. Come experience the power of God. So, uh, but tomorrow we got to contact them. Just somebody remind me. We got to contact them and we got to put in full page, no matter what it costs. For the next three to four weeks, we must put in a full page thing in the Clansdorp record, our, our local newspaper, and say, come and see what God is doing. You know, not shrinking back. And it came to pass, verse 29. They cried loud, verse 28, they cut themselves with knives. And then when it came to pass at, at, at midday, and they prophesied in the offering of the evening, saying there was neither voice nor answer nor anyone that regarded them. And Elijah said, come near to me. And all the people came near unto him. 
and he prepared the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Mm. Are you prepared to say this? Say it. Amen. Say it again. Amen. Elijah said, now come to me. And all the people came to him. And then he stood with the people and prepared the altar of the Lord. Remember in first, uh, Second Kings chapter 5, remember when Naaman, the head of the Syrian army, had leprosy? And the king sent a letter because of a little girl that said, you know, Israel, you know, there's a God there that does miracles. Send a letter to the king and said, you know, here's my, my commander of my army. And the king tore his clothes and said, am I God to heal or make alive or kill? And, you know, and Elisha heard and he sent a letter back. He said, let him come to me. Then you will find out that there is a prophet in Israel. Come on. I tell you, I dare you. I release you. I loosen you. I speak over your life. It's time to say, I've got it. I can do it. I've got the power to set you free. I think my greatest lesson I learned was James Robeson, that big, tall Texan preacher, you know, six foot seven inches tall, big man, you know, uh, 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 his mother threw him away when he was a baby in a black township, put him in a shoebox and put him in front of our black lady's uh, 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 house. And the lady got up and heard the noise, opened the shoebox, and this was here, was this little white baby. Now, I mean, America has got more apartheid than South Africa ever had, let me tell you. Okay, so got this little baby, and, and she just, you know, fed him up. When he went to high school, he only knew this big, fat Negro mother. White boy in a black township. He had so many disadvantages. He had inferior complexes. He didn't know how to eat in front of people because he was this tall chap standing head and shoulders above all his classmates, uh, the only white guy in a black community. He said at the, in, in, in grade 11, he couldn't eat his sandwiches in front of the guys, so he had to hide behind the wall and eat his sandwiches. So one day, an evangelist came to the school. And he stood out. He said, the tall white guy, God's going to use you to preach to more people than any person ever alive preached to. And he passed Billy Graham in the 70s. He passed Billy Graham with the amount of people that Billy Graham ever preached to. And he preached in seven years to more people than Billy Graham preached to in his whole life. For those who don't know the history, you know, don't know the history. Huh? Huh? But he had all these complexes. And because of that, he was bound by so many spirits. So when he went out of school, he came into the ministry. But with all these complexes, he married a beautiful wife. But, you know, he had all this all the trouble and he just couldn't get victory over stuff. And one night he decided, you know, I'm preaching to five, six hundred thousand people at a time. And he got into his private jet and he said, between services... I'm just going to fly around New York and just <laughs> head down and I'm going to commit suicide. And he says, and as he was on this nosedive down, the word of the Lord came to him <laughs> and said, go park your plane and go to the church where you're preaching this week. So he <laughs> back to the airport, parked, took a taxi, went to the church, and there was nobody in the church except the guy that's cleaning, the janitor. And this guy was walking around with the vacuum cleaner, and he came in, and he thought maybe God wants him to pray, so he went to the pulpit, and he heard the vacuum cleaner go off. And here comes the janitor. He says, uh, Pastor Robeson, I've got the power to set you free. <laughs> says, and he pulled out a chair, and he says, come sit on this chair. He said, the janitor. I'm preaching to more people than any preacher before me ever preached to. Here comes the gen. says, uh, I've got the power. Laid hands on him and said, I set you free. And he walked away. He said when that guy walked away, it felt like iron claws that were on his brain that just collapsed. It felt like steel pins in his arms just broke. He said he felt the stuff broke. He looked up 
And he said he looked, everything looked different. He ran to a telephone box. He phoned his wife. He says, Betty, I'm free. I'm free. And he's been preaching to millions upon millions of people saying, you've got the power. Set people free. You've got the power. Heal the sick. You've got the power. Come on, say, I've got it. Elijah said, come to me. We're so far away from our message, but I hope it's good. I don't know, you know, maybe God is just coming to us tonight. <clears throat> Verse 36, and, at the, and it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abram, Isaac, and Israel. And there you can just see he reminded God of his promises. Because in that time, that's where the promises was. Let it be known this day, listen to this. That you are God, and I am your servant. And that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord. Hear me. That this people may know you are God. And that you have turned their hearts back. Then the fire of the Lord fell. Bam! Consumed the stones, the dust, the offering, the sacrifice. Licked up the water in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell down and said, The Lord is God. The Lord is God. <laughs> and Elijah prophesied, verse 41, and said, There's a sound of abundance of rain. Verse 42. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, cast himself down upon the earth, put his face between his knees. After he prayed the fire down, he prophesied, he prophesied the rain. That didn't fall for three and a half years. Yet, he had to pray. Seven times for the rain to come. And the way he prayed, he put his head between his knees. That is called travail. That is the way a woman gives birth in the East. Okay? You go to the black communities up in northern Transvaal, they sit on their haunches and give birth. If you go to the white hospital, they lie on their backs. You go to the East, they put their heads between their knees. Different ways of giving birth. Okay? So, what was Elijah doing? He was going into travail. He said, I'm going to give birth to this rain thing. So I want to ask you, how many prophecies have you got? How many dreams have you got? How many visions have you got of what God wants to do, what he said he will do? Maybe you've got nothing, but you've got a whole book full. What would you do to get this stuff to work in your life? Would you just, ah, oh, well, if God wants me to have it, I'll get it. Or would you go pray, prophesy, and go into the very secret place where the entrance is made for you by the blood of Jesus, put your head between your knees, go into a time of not just prayer, but go into a time of man over and over. Oh, God, my Father, you promised. Lord, you said you're going to do it. Thank you for the excitement in the house. What would you do? I mean, I mean, we see all this stuff now, you know, because, you know, he's, he's, you know God's blue-eyed boy, he just promised prophesies and stuff happen. But what happens at nighttime when everybody sleeps? What happened when you're alone and I get in my car night after night and drive through the city with my car, night after night and pray and cry out to God, come stop in this parking area and walk on these humps and scream out to God, you know? Oh, nobody knows about that. What happens when everybody sleeps and I go to the lounge and I fall on my knees and say, God, I said this is going to happen. Now this Sunday I cry, my father, let it happen at this pool of Bethesda. Father, there's got to be this, there's got to be that. I mean, we see the results. But do you know about the secret life, the secret prayer life? What would you do to get results? I prophesy I'm, I'm going to get that car, you know, with an overdraft of 93,000 rand, not money in the bank. And I said, by tomorrow, ask my children, I said, tomorrow I'm going to buy that car and another car and I'm going to give to the church. Then I go to my room at night when everybody sleeps. God, oh, Father, there must be 300,000 rand. Thank you. It 
that's not works. People argue, Chris, but that's works. That's not grace. That's works. That's not grace. Okay, would you with your grace show me your results? God hasn't cut prayer out of the New Testament. God is emphasizing prayer in the New Testament. I wonder how late it is. I lost most of you now. And it came to pass, verse 45, that the heaven was black with clouds and wind. And there was a great rain. I thought you were going to scream. In a minute, the clouds were black and a great rain. Afrikaans Bible says there were showers. And at one point was the bulk of donker and was a stolte rain. There was a time in my life when I preached a lot at other churches. Big churches. The one preacher came to me and says, you're intimidating the people with your prayer life and the way you study the Bible. True. In Pretoria. The church where some of our members were. I walked out there, I said, Lord, I will not do it again. I will not tell people how I pray. I will not pe tell people how I read Bible. So at the pastor's conference, I just tell people, fall in love with the word, kiss it, say thank you, Jesus, read the book, but I don't emphasize how I read Bible. I just tell them, I read it, I read it. And I don't tell people how I pray because of that guy. And while I'm speaking here, it's like God is liberating me and say, you're not here to intimidate people, you're here to help people. So I want to say, when people sleep, I pray. When people lie around, I cry unto God. At nighttime, I'm not scared to get up 2 o'clock. I'm not scared. If I wake up, I'm not scared to get up. I'm not scared to walk down the passage in my house and cry out to God. I'm not scared to fall on my face and scream to God, Lord, I prophesied Sunday. Now you got to show it on this next Sunday. Father, I said it here. And I want to say to you, we see all the, res res the results here in this house. Maybe somebody's crying out to God in travailing prayer. And I don't want to intimidate you, but I want to inspire you tonight. Everything is not falling out of heaven. Thank you. I never thought I'll say it again in all my life. Yeah. I never thought I'll say it again. Never, 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 never. I never say it till, until, until for the last 10 years, I've never said to anybody how I pray. Never. I never proclaimed how I pray. I never told people how I read Bible. I tried to just keep it aside. And tonight, like God says, but this guy is not scared to tell it. The whole Bible is full of it. Why don't you tell your people you pray? Why don't you tell your people some of the stuff happens because there's a man that's crying out to God? I mean, Elijah. Wow. What a man. Is that good? Part A. Part B, chapter 19. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. Verse 2, then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me. <laughs> the gods that he just killed, the prophets of, he now get a message from these false gods that you're going to die before tomorrow. He says, by tomorrow this time, you're a dead man. When he saw that, he arose and, and he ran for his life. King James said he went for his life. He ran, man, to Beersheba, where he belonged to Judah and left his servant there. You know, he didn't leave his servant there. He ran away from his servant. His servant couldn't keep up. For somebody that want to go study this stuff. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and he requested for himself that he might die. Are you still here? And he said, it's enough, Lord. Take away my life. I'm not better than this. When you face up with a dictator, you must stay in the secret place. We had the Hitlers, the Idi Amin's, and now the Mugabe's. They make statements and the whole country fear. Even if they have no one to back them up, their voice sends terror through the country. Idi Amin stood up, nobody in his country was for him, but if he said something, everybody feared what he said. It's the spirit 
And I want to say to this crowd of people tonight, I'm struggling right now. I would love for you to pray for So, uh, so uh, don't be scared of dictating spirits in political realms. It's the men of God that change the countries, not political arenas. Political dictators caused hurt and caused damage and caused poverty and caused bankruptcy and caused famine to come into lands. It's men of God that broke famines. It's men of God that brought rain. It's men of God that brought victory. And we need to realize, are we going to be men and women of God? Or are we going to fear dictators? So we're not going to fear, you know, now, you know, Lynn said to me before the meeting, there's a tape going around in the area, CD, about all the calamity that's now going to happen when Mandela dies. It's going to be war and blood. There's not going to be anything like it. They said it about the 1994 election. There's not going to be. God says, I know the thoughts that I have for you. Thoughts of peace and a prosperous future. God is about to get his church, but he's looking for men and women that will stand up, go to the secret place and say, I want the word of the Lord. Speak it. Let me just cut myself off and get back to the message again because I wanted to get involved with you so that you can be with me so you can just take whatever you want to. Okay? But he went himself, and you know, verse 7, And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Rise, eat, because your journey is too great. Listen here. If you want to run away from your problem, listen to this word. God will give you the strength to run away from your problem. God will even help you. He'll even send you support. I'm giving you a word tonight that will shock you. People say, Chris, but I heard from the Lord. You know, I even got this just this last week. Four people came to us, four people, and say, because we heard so directly from God that we must do that and that. God even helped us to get the lawyer to do it and that and that, and then the advocate do that. I said, how sure are you it was God? I said, maybe you had a wrong thing going. And God said, if that's your desire. Remember, I've got a lot of funny looks right now. Have you ever read Psalm 105, 106, and 107? God says, the children of Israel cried unto him for bread. He gave them the desires of their heart, but sent a leanness into their soul. That they ate the bread till it came out of their nostrils, and they vomited the bread out that they ate. But I said, they ate angel's food, yet they vomited it out. It's not God's idea to give them the bread. It was their idea. God wanted to do much more supernatural stuff for them than that. They said they limited the Holy One of Israel. <laughs> Trying hard. If you are not living in the presence of the Almighty God, if you walk out and listen to the rumors that's outside, and you start and fear starts getting hold of you and you start acting, God will support you. Not a lot of amens now. I've got the whole Bible. God will support you. God supported Elijah. Even sent an angel to bake him food. Said, if you want to run, run, but you're going to run for 40 days and 40 nights. Hmm? So I want to say, stay in the presence of the Almighty God. Get the word of the Lord. Don't get a word from Jezebel. Don't get a word from Balaam. Don't get a word from wicked political leaders. Get a word from the Lord. If this is what God says, this is where we're going to go. He just pray down fire. Just pray down rain. Now he runs away from a woman. He just killed all 850 of her prophets. Personally cut their necks off. Now the woman that's in charge of them, he fears her. So God says, you want fear? I'll help you. I'll prove it to you now. So he arose and ate and drank, verse 8, and went in the strength of that meat for 40 days and 40 nights. Come on, we we'll take now. Unto Herb the Mount of God, verse 9. And he came to a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Okay. Now look here. Look here. The word of the Lord came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord. Children of Israel forsook this covenant, threw down their altars, slay their prophets. I am the only one left. And he said, and God said, Go forth and stand upon the mountain before the Lord. Listen, I want to help you. When God spoke the first time, it was passing him by 
It was a fleeting thing. Phew. What are you doing here, Elijah? He says, oh, well. And he was moaning. He was in depression. He was having the blues. I'm the only one left in the world. But he didn't speak to God. He was speaking to himself, thinking that God is him and him is God. It was just a fleeting thing. I'll prove it to you now what's happening, and I hope you're going to stick with me. So Elijah sitting there. God says, what are you doing here, Elijah? You've ran for 40 days and 40 nights by the food that I sent an angel to give you. What are you doing here? <laughs> then the word of the Lord came to him again. He said, Elijah, you were used to say, the Lord before whom I stand. Would you just come out of that mood and come stand before me? Would you just come and stand before me? Listen. Come and stand before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. Just like Exodus 33 with Moses. A great strong wind rent the mountains. Broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. The Lord, not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. The Lord, not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, a fire. The Lord, not in the fire. Okay, so what was the wind, the earthquake? What was the fire? What was it? It is, God says, a fire goes before him. He rides on winds. Okay, thank you. So this is the chariot coming. And so it says, God is on his way, Elijah. You just stood out of your blues, and the fact that you stood up, here's God coming. See the wind? See the, it's not God. It's just, here's the sign. Please, man, I'm not here with you. God is on his way. There's his chariot coming. Do you want to read Exodus? Fire on the mountain, smoke, shaking, earthquakes. God was not there. And he said, and after the earthquake, God came down and spoke to Moses. So this is just, here's God coming. Fire gone, wind gone, earthquake gone breaks on, <laughs> and here comes the voice of the Lord. Listen to this. After the earthquake fire, and then a still, small voice. Hmm? And it was so when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle, went and stood in the entering of the cave, and behold, there came a voice unto him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? The exact same is before the Lord said, go out. And he said the same story. I have been jealous. The house of Israel, they have forsaken thy covenant. Same story. I slain their prophets. I'm the only one left. And the Lord says, go, return on your way. In other words, go back where you first, where you last left the Holy of Holies. And go do your job. Go anoint the king. Go anoint the prophet. Go and do some stuff. Man, man, man. James chapter 5. Verse 17. Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. One day up, next day down. Kill 850 prophets, then run away for the woman. Elijah was a man subject to like passion, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. Now, we have no record where he prayed not for the rain. We only have a record where he said to Ahab, it will not rain. But then we have a record where he said it will rain. And he prayed earnestly, and it rained not. And he prayed again. And the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. How did he pray? travailing intense of prayer over and over and over. So what am I trying to tell you tonight? I'm saying, you know, what are we doing with our prayer lives? For anybody in the house, uh, I, I, wa I want to talk tonight to you a little bit on prayer. For the next half an hour, I want to talk to you about your prayer life. All right. Verse, verse 17. Oh, we did verse 17. Hmm? Verse 16. Confess your faults one to another. Pray one for another that you may be healed. Next portion. Amplified Bible. The earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available 
which is dynamic in its working. Verse 11. Behold, we count them happy which endure. You have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Hmm? Job chapter 22. You okay? Do you want to hear the rest? Well, we're hearing it together. Job 22. Verse 21. 21 amplified. Acquaint yourself with him, that is with God. Agree with God. <laughs> I, I'm bringing you a word from the Lord. Agree with God. Show yourself to be conformed to his will. And be at peace. By that you shall prosper, and great good shall come to you. Receive, I pray you, the law and instruction from his mouth. Lay up his words in your heart. If you return to the Almighty, you shall be built up. You shall put away iniquity from your tabernacles. Then you shall lay up gold as dust. You know the revelation there. You dust the house today, tomorrow the dust is there again. You dust the house the next day, the next day the dust is there again. So God says, if you do what I'm telling you, you're going to lay up gold as dust. In other words, it'll never dry up. It'll never, it'll just always be there. If you think you've used it up, it's there again. Yes, the Almighty shall you be to your fence. For then you shall have thy delight in the Almighty and he shall lift up your face. Verse 27, you shall make your prayer unto him. And he shall hear you. Verse 28. You shall decree a thing and it shall be established. Wow. <laughs> Chapter 42 verse 10 says, And Job prayed for his friends and God turned his captivity and gave him twice as much as he had before. Hallelujah. You've got it, have you got it? Get it on the camera? Though I have all knowledge of prayer, though I know all mysteries about prayer, though I read all books on prayer, though I listen to all series on prayer, except I pray I'll never learn to pray. Did you got it? Thank you. We had in our country in the 50s and 60s and early 70s a man by the name of William Duma black preacher in a white community in the Ungeni Road Baptist Church in Durban. Raised people from the dead, saw the most awesome miracles, pray the power of God down, saw miracles that will make your ears scream for hours. He read a book by Sudar Singh. Sadhu Sundar Singh, at the age of 16, wanted to throw himself in front of a train in India. And the Lord met him, appeared unto him and said, I am Jesus. Sundar Singh was thrown out of a very rich Sikh family, the Singhs, and uh, he started following Jesus, became the biggest preacher India ever had. 
saw so many miracles when he came about seven miles from a village hospital, people in the hospital started getting healed without, and, and then they would say, Sundar must be close by. So William Duma read this life story of Sundar Singh, and he decided that's going to be his life. Sundar Singh says, it's not enough to have the fire. It must be constantly kindled by prayer. So William Duma made a vow to God. He said, as long as I live, every night at 12 o'clock, I will get up to pray. And he said, I've kept this till the day I died. Every night at 12, he got up to pray. He said, it's not enough to have the fire. You must constantly kindle the fire. By prayer. Mm? Mm? Out of the 1800 revivals, they said, sinning people don't pray, and praying people don't sin. Okay, so Matthew chapter 6. I hope I can get you to pray. So I can drop something in your heart tonight to realize. Everyone wants to know something about prayer. If you don't pray, verse 5, Matthew 6. When you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. They love to pray standing in the synagogues. <laughs> Where must you stand before the Lord? <laughs> and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by people. Truly, I tell you, they have reward in full already. Lord, must I say something? We pray every Monday here. We pray every Friday here. But that's like a little tip of the iceberg. That's not my prayer life. That's just when I pray with you and teach you how to pray every Monday. Say, pray this, pray that. That's not my prayer life. No. This is to teach you how to pray. My prayer life is in secret. Not with my wife, not with my sons. My prayer life is my prayer life. My prayer life is a meeting with the Most High God. It's special. Where do I get all the word that I preach? Where do I get all the messages without notes? You know, where would I get it? Thank you. Just to help you tonight. But when you pray, go into your most private room. Close your door. Pray to your Father who is in secret. Your Father who sees in secret will reward you in the open. Hmm? And when you pray, do not heap up phrases. Hmm? Verse 8, do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you pray. Mark chapter 10. I want to put in a point here that's very valid. Hmm? If the Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, if he says through his only son that was born of a virgin, that became the firstborn of many brethren. If he says through him, God knows exactly what you need. Then why do I have to pray? This is what people say. Because why do you people pray in such hours? If God then knows, why do you pray? You know, that is not what Jesus said. Listen to what Jesus said. Your father knows what you need. Before you pray. I want to repeat that again. Your father knows exactly what you need. Comma. Before you pray. In other words, no matter how great the need, if you don't pray. So what is God saying? He says, I know what you need in your ministry. But I want to know if you know. Okay. Okay. There's a time when my children were small when we just gave them stuff because they're small. They're only saying, Wah. and you give them milk and dry them up and, you know. And as they grow bigger, they come start asking things. Some of the stuff we know they don't need, so we don't give it. And as they grow older, they come and say, can I have that? And I was just about to buy it. Uh, but if I buy it, I wonder if they really need it. And if I buy it, I wonder if they really want it. And then they come and say, say ah, and then God says, that's more or less it. I know you need it. 
But I want to know if you know you need it. Yeah. Hmm? Your father knows what you need before you ask. If it doesn't make sense, let's go to the next portion. Let's go to the next portion. Now remember all the prophecies of Jesus being the son of David. Jesus was born after the flesh out of the tribe of Judah being the son of David. Hmm? But remember, Matthew chapter 3, the angel came unto Joseph and Mary in a dream and said, go to Egypt because Herod's about to kill the baby. So they fled to Egypt. And then they came back and said, and when they came back, they went and dwelt in his own hometown that it might be fulfilled what was spoken by the prophets that he would be called the Nazarene, Jesus of Nazareth. Now, you go through this Bible, there's nowhere in this Old Testament where it says he will be called Jesus of Nazareth. Yet, the angel said it had to be fulfilled that he would be called Jesus of Nazareth. That's why he had to dwell in Nazareth. But yet, you go through the Bible, you don't find it. Till you go and look at the Greek word. For those who have been here when I taught that, means a little village. Eth is a village. Naza is a, a branch of no significance. Okay? A branch. No, it says Isaiah 9, 10. Eight, actually from chapter 5. Eight, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. He says uh, he's got an axe in his hand. Remember John the Baptist is baptizing? And the Pharisees want to be baptized. He says, ah, 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 who are you to think you're going to escape? He says, look, his axe is already in his hand. Yeah. And he's ready to purge his floor. You know, remember? So Isaiah says he's got the axe in his hand. I think the King James said he's got an iron in his hand. Got an axe in And he's ready to chop off the trees. So John the Baptist says, uh, go bear fruit. Every tree that is not planted by my father will be uprooted. Go bear fruit. So Jesus is going to chop off the trees. So Isaiah says he's chopping off the trees and his hand is stretched out. And when all the trees are chopped off and burned down, there will be a branch. From the stem of Jesse. And in whom shall the nation... Zechariah chapter 3, the same one we read earlier on. It says, when, when, when he clothed, you know, Joshua the high priest with the clean clothes and said, your sins are gone. He says, behold, there's a man coming whose name is the branch. So it's prophesied throughout the Bible. There will be a branch of no significance that will stay in a little village. Nazareth. Okay. So when he stayed in Nazareth, that's why he's called Jesus of Nazareth, fulfilling the prophets. People look at me like I come from space. Okay. <laughs> Nazareth meaning branch of no significance, Eth meaning little village. So Jesus went to stay in a little village that it had to be fulfilled that he would be called Jesus of Nazareth. Okay. So, but after the flesh, he's born son of David. Keep that too. Nobody knows he's the son of David. Nobody knows he's son of David. They know he's Jesus of Nazareth because he came from Nazareth. And whenever a prophet came from a city, they called him after his city. So they said, this is Jesus from Nazareth. Hmm? This is Jesus from Nazareth. Hmm? And, it, and they came to Jericho, verse 46. And as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the wayside begging. Okay, just look here. This guy's blind. <laughs> He's begging. He can't see, but he can hear the dude. So he, oh, commotion, commotion. You know, hey, phew, phew, it's dust this day, man. Commotion. Okay, you don't read pictures, I do. And listen, when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry and say, Jesus, son of David. Nobody had the revelation now. Up till now, nobody knew he was the son of David. They knew he was the prophet from Nazareth. Here is blind Bartimaeus begging, Jesus of Nazareth. Ah, the prophet said he would be called 
the Nazarene. So if this is it, this must be the son of David. If it's the son of David, then Isaiah must come into fulfillment. If he comes, he will restore the mercies of David. What is the mercies of David? Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. Let my prayer come before you. Have you read the Psalms? It is a book of prayer. Every Psalm, hear my cry. My prayer is before you. My cry is before you. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. On me oh Lord take not your mercy somebody please in Jesus name let mercy be upon me here comes this man ah oh, he's blind but revelation knowledge son of David yeah. but with all the revelation you can have all the adjectives and you can have you know everything all the adjectives all the revelations all the attributes in the names of God. You can, oh, you are wonderful. You are my counselor, my mighty God. You are the 10,000 one. You are the brightest morning star. You can have it all. And you can try and impress God. And you can have all the revelations of who he is. Yet he says, I know exactly what you want. Stop the protocol. What do you want? Your father knows what you need before you pray. I'm going to prove it to you in a minute. Many charged him and said, hold your peace. In other words, good Afrikaans, shut up. But he cried. <laughs> he cried louder. Son of David, have mercy. Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man saying unto him, be of good comfort. Rise, he called you. And cast down his garment, rose and came to Jesus. Now, there's a good story in that the blind people had to wear a garment to prove that they are allowed by the government to beg. So he threw up his begging garment knowing that you're going to be healed for those who want to go. That's faith in action, okay? Okay, verse 51. And Jesus answered and said unto him, oh, Come now, man, nobody, please, is it too late? Jesus answered and said unto him, what will you that I should do unto you? The blind man said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. Your father knows what you need before you pray. You can have all the revelations of how he answers prayer. You can have all the revelations of how God heals the sick. You can have all the revelations. God is saying, would you tell me? This is how I operate. That is why God has placed such an emphasis on prayer right through the Bible. From Genesis, Abraham is a prophet. He will pray for you. Moses is my prophet. Let him pray pray for you. And Jacob prayed all night long. Prayer is in every book of the Bible. God says, I need people to pray. And if they pray, they take, come right into my holy of holies. Here they can see a vision. They can get my word and bam. So if I don't get a word, I ask him or I ask for what I need. I thought this is going to be good. Mm. Everyone. The book of Psalms, the book of Acts is primarily two books of prayer. So let's go to Luke 24 and Acts 1. I'm nearly finished. I said nine. What's the time? I can make it to maybe. Okay, I'm doing this for you. Some preachers preach because they got to. Otherwise, they don't get their salary at the end of the month. <laughs> this is not a job. We stand in a calling here. Mm. Verse 49 says, Behold, I send you the promise of my Father. This is a promise. Listen here. I, I'm going to send you the promise of my Father. It's a promise. But, <laughs> I wish I could get the people. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you get the power. I'm going to send the promise. But, verse 53, and they were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Acts 1. Verse 
Verse 4. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. See the tarry there? Go stay in Jerusalem. And wait for the promise of the Father that you heard of me. Okay, is this a promise they're going to get it? Did Jesus say they're going to get it? Did Jesus say if they wait, they're going to get it? So they only have to go sit and wait. And then they're going to get the promise. Jesus said, go sit and wait and you get the promise. Right? Verse 8, and you shall receive power after this Holy Ghost has come upon you. Verse 14, then they all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. In other words, continuous pleading for the promise of the Spirit. God already said, just wait, Terry. And then they knew God knows that they need it. God promised, Elijah, show yourself to Ahab, I send rain. Elijah prophesy rain, then Elijah go pray seven times for the rain. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit, go wait, then they go pray and plead for the Holy Spirit to come. Why do we pray continuously Monday after Monday? Come on, don't stop with your prayers. Father, let it break through, please, in Jesus' name. Okay? They continued with one accord in prayer. And when the day of Pentecost, chapter 2, verse 1, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord. What was the one accord? He just told us in prayer. They were the one accord in prayer. What were they praying for? For the Holy Spirit promise. But if God said it, it doesn't that mean, you know, you're just getting it? Well, the Bible is full every time they still had to go pray for it. Every revival broke out because people prayed. 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 Chapter 4. Remember after they healed the sick man, the gate called beautiful, and the Pharisees were not so happy as they were. They said, you're not going to preach again. Verse 24, when they heard it, they lift up their voice with one accord. Okay, how do they lift up their voice with one accord? He told us in chapter 1, in prayer. And they said, Lord, so they're praying because they're talking to God. Lord God, which have made heaven and earth and sea and all, who by the mouth of your servant David has said, why did they even now they quote Psalm 2? They're praying the words of God back to God. Verse 29, and now, Lord, behold their threatenings. And here comes John G. Lake, and give your servant that with all boldness I may speak your word, so that you will stretch out your hand to heal Signs, wonders may be done in the name of your holy child, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken. Where they were assembled, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. This is what they asked. And they spoke the word with boldness. This is what they asked. Verse 33, and with great power gave the apostles witness. This is what they asked. Is it all right? Chapter 13. How far can we go in one night, Lord Jesus? Hmm? Let's do chapter 6. The apostle said, it's not right that we should be superintendents in the work of the Lord. It's not right that we run after everybody and see that you do your job. It's not right for us to do this and do that. And see that everybody gets money and everybody gets food and everybody gets, you know. It's not right for us to do welfare work. We are not welfare. It's there. Verse 4. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So if we can pray more, we can minister better. That's why so many people haven't got a word. They don't pray. And they got those deacons and they prayed for them and they laid hands on them. No wonder they were so full of power. They got hands laid on them after prayer. Thank you. I don't think I'll be able to do that. How can we do that? I want you to do chapter 9 and 10, the whole chapter 9, the whole chapter 10. But we can't do it now. Mm. Sure. Do 
Ephesians 4 quickness. This is too much, Lord. I can't do it. How am I going to do this? There's no way we can do it. Forgive me. I wanted to do 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Hmm? The book of Acts, chapter after chapter, pray, 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 pray. I'll just try and wrap it up. Chapter 6, chapter 13, chapter 14, you can read stuff like, whenever they wanted people to do something for God, they first prayed. Father, we're going to send these people out to go on the streets today. They're going to dish out bread there at the bus stop at the taxi rank. We pray that they will be the servants of God, that they will be anointed. Now come stand in line. Then they laid hands on them. Power, power, power. Every time, whenever Paul left the city, he first got the people together and they knelt. And he prayed, said, I'm going to leave you today. I'm going to go to another city. Let's pray together. Do you still pray about everything that you're going to do? Do you still pray about every venture that you take? Do you still get the people together? Come, let's take hands. Let's pray. Okay? Do you still pray about everything you do? We were in Bible school. I remember the guy that gave us Greek classes. He said, it's stupid to keep God busy with all your prayers. God knows you're going to travel today. If I get in my car, if I get in my car 10 times a day, if I get in my car, I say, thank you, Lord, for this car. Thank you that I'm traveling safely wherever I go. No, but you prayed in the morning that God will protect you. So Paul prayed every time that he did anything. You go read the book of Acts. I'm <laughs> here for the help. Okay? So Acts chapter 9 and 10 is the following story. Paul is there. I did share it with you last week. Paul is on his road to persecute the church. A light struck him down. Jesus speaks and says, why do you persecute me? He said, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus. Go to the street called Straight. And as he got there, God comes to Ananias. He says, Ananias, go to the street called Straight. There's a man by the name of Saul. Behold, he is praying. And while Ananias was praying, the Lord spoke and said, I have shown him how much. And as Paul was praying, he saw a man by the name of Ananias laying hands on him and said, Saul, brother. And as Ananias was praying, he saw the man Saul being filled with the Spirit. And as Saul was praying, prayer can give you divine connections. Hmm? Chapter 10. Cornelius is praying, and an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a vision and said, Go to Simon the Tanner, because there's Simon Peter. Simon Peter is praying at Simon Tanner's house. And as he's praying, he sees in a vision three men coming to get him at the door. And the angel of the Lord said, Go down to them. God says to this guy, Send men there. God, sir, if you pray, somewhere you'll get a connection. You never know what your future holds if you don't pray. You know, prayer will open doors, will break through visions, will bring stuff your way, will make divine connections. And before you know it, you'll get, oh, would you come pray here? Would you come preach here? You know, I pray. Hmm? Oh, I'd love to go to Singapore. Why Singapore? I don't know. I don't know where Singapore is. I still don't know where it is. I was there twice already. I just pray one day. Oh, Singapore. Why Singapore? I don't know. Maybe somebody once said Singapore is a nice place. I don't know. So I'm praying. Oh, Father, I want to, you know, well, Singapore, just the desire of my heart, Singapore. My phone rings. Eric Lee from Pretoria. Most of you know Eric. Corpus. I'm in Singapore. I said, what are you doing in Singapore? I'm here for business with a guy that's my partner from Singapore, George, a Chinese guy. I said, wow. He said, I'm here with a pastor by the name of Tay Ching Ke. I said, yes. Would you speak to him on the telephone? Oh, brother. My name is Tay. Nyongqing Wang Peng Wang. True story, no joke. True story. Okay. 
Eric, Eric told me about the miracles. Would you come? So they sitting at a table, and Eric tells him, Jesus, this guy said, let's pray that he will come. So they take hands over the table. Father, I pray, oh, Lord, I love it. Divine connection. Okay? So we thinking of building a church, thinking of building a church. I had this dream, 1982. So I go to Singapore the first time. So the last church we minister is Stay Ching Kee's church. Hmm? Now he didn't call me. Another guy organized the meetings. Stay Ching didn't know about the meetings. I want to tell you how God operates. But the last church that we ministered was his church because he heard that I was coming, so he saw the organizer and said, can I be involved too? Okay, so forget that. <laughs> Doesn't make sense now. And uh, so we come around the corner. Here's the church. Ah, stained glass windows. A tower. Our foyer with a Corinthian foyer with a tower on top. I start weeping. I say, I don't believe this. So we get out of the car. This guy doesn't know what I'm looking like. I don't know what he looks like. <laughs> so we got out of the car. He comes out of his church. We both looked at each other and we wept. We wept. We can't stop weeping. We can't greet each other. We hang on each other's shoulders and we just weep and weep. I said, I've seen this church in a vision, 1982. He said, I've seen you in a vision in 1982. And we talk about, and divine connection, my friend. He said, I've got a pool of Bethesda. Big pool outside his church. I said, what for? No, that people can just associate. I said, ah, ah, we're going to get the people in the pool. He said, We had a pool service, 3,700 people. You know, 14 people got out of wheelchairs, but I, I, I'm not going to bore you. I want to say, so I'm going for the third time in two weeks. God makes divine connections when you pray. You never know what's going to happen, man. Oh, man, I wish I could do more. I wish I could do more. I wish I could do more. Well, huh? You know, I, wa I wanted to do this in, in yeah, yeah, where over and over from chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, every time it says they prayed and fasted. And God said they prayed and fasted and the Lord said they prayed and fasted and they laid hands on him. And, and visions came. Revelations came. And then it took me to Matthew chapter 17 when Jesus came down the mountain with James, John, and Peter. And there was this demonized little child there that gave his father all the problems. And said, I brought him to your disciples. They could not cast him out. Jesus said, oh, unbelieving generation. Oh, unbelieving generation. Later, the disciples come and said, Jesus, why couldn't we cast him out? Jesus said, because of your unbelief. But this generation, original language, does not go out without prayer and fasting. Not the generation of devils, the generation of unbelief. In other words, if you've been in a generation of unbelief, you get rid of your unbelief by prayer and fasting. So why must I fast to get rid of unbelief? You've got enough belief in you, but belief and unbelief operate at the same time. You've got guts to, I'm going to take this guy out of the wheelchair. And when you get there, unbelief starts operating. No, you can't take him out. But you just believe from there to here. Why do you now doubt? Come on, Jesus. Oh, ye of little faith, walking on the water, then sinking. Why did you doubt? Belief and unbelief can operate the same time in one person. So how do I get rid of unbelief? Prayer and fasting. How do I get rid of unbelief? Prayer and fasting. I'm serious. I'm serious. I'm serious. Okay? Prayer and fasting gets rid of unbelief. Mm -hmm. Two examples and then we close. John Knox. I told you. How many are still in church? Yeah. Yeah. 
Lindsay Brown, John Knox, 1540. There's a queen in Scotland, Mary. She kills left, right, and center. She doesn't care about nobody's lives. But she fear one man, five foot four inches. He's riding on a horse in front of the queen's house, the castle, and he screams out, God, give me Scotland or I'll die. And this queen says to the reporters, I fear this man's prayers more than the armies of Great Britain. Right? So she sends a letter to John Knox, for those who got his book, it's there in my bookshelf. Front page, if you turn it over, it's there. Before you read the foreword, it's there. The letter that was sent to John Knox. I'm going to kill you. He wrote back, why should I fear the queen? I've just spent eight hours with the king. So this reporter really got upset. So he decided he's going to watch this guy's prayer life out. If you heard the story, just hear it again. He's going to check this guy. It was snowing like 30 centimeters thick in Scotland. And it doesn't snow. It just snowed now. Last week, it snowed all over Scotland and England, for those who do not know. Okay? So it snows now and then, but it's not a regular thing. So those days, it snowed 30 centimeters thick. And he followed this guy on his horse. And he saw him go into the bushes deeper, 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 deeper. And uh, took his coat off, dust the snow off the tree stump that was lying there, opened his Bible, put it down on this tree, and knelt down in the snow and started praying. No words coming out. He says, for eight hours I watched him, and the only thing I heard every 20 minutes or so, I heard, oh God. Then there was nothing. Then I would hear, Oh, God. Then nothing. Then I would hear, mm, Oh, God. For eight hours, I had to watch him every 20 or 15 minutes say, Oh, God. He said, As I watched him, the snow melted till it was a 10-foot diameter puddle of water that he knelt in. He said, He got up, took his coat, took his Bible, got on his horse and went back. He said, I was so inquisitive and I was so, just to find out what was behind this man. So I walked into that puddle of water. He said, when I walked and stood where he stood, my knees buckled. I fell on my face, it's there in the book, and the God of John Knox became the Lord of my life. Hmm? And he's the one that wrote the life story of John Knox because he was the reporter for the Queen, okay? So uh, 1700s, Charles Finney came along. And, uh, you know, he's sitting in, he's a lawyer, studying to be a lawyer. And they, the guy that he's working for, the lawyer company, asked him to come to a prayer meeting. After four weeks going to the prayer meeting, he says to this guy, do you believe in this God that you pray to? They say, yes. He says, but nothing happens. You pray the same stuff and nothing happens. And he got so fed up with these guys that he walked into the bushes, he said, and something pushed him to go deeper and deeper. And every time he wanted to talk to God, he felt maybe someone will see him, so he walked deeper into the bushes. He said, and all of a sudden, something grabbed him in his stomach. And the only thing he could say was, oh, God. He said, groanings too deep to utter. And he said, God, if you are a reality, then answer me now. He said, and he started weeping. He couldn't stop weeping. And he said he felt how he became clean. The blood washed him. Jesus became his savior. He went back to the lawyer's company. The power of God just started coming. And he had the greatest revivals ever of any man. He said, and when they asked him what your secret was, he said, I had to go deeper and deeper into the bushes because I couldn't pray. The groanings was too loud. I was scared. I want to scare people. Okay? So I think this is more or less what Elijah had travailing in prayer. Mm. So Romans 8.26, we do not rightly know what to pray for. But we do know what to pray for. But we do not know rightly what to pray for. So the Holy Spirit comes to our aid. With groanings 
that cannot be uttered. It doesn't say the groanings cannot be uttered. The groanings are so deep that you can't utter speech. So the only thing that can come out is, oh God, when last did you pray? And the only thing that could come out of your mouth was, oh God. Yeah. Thank you, it's really hard now. I thought it was gonna be good at the end. So uh, this is what God showed me in 1986. He says, the spirit of travailing prayer is the prayer that I want on every person, but because nobody teaches it, nobody gets it. He said, but everybody, when once taught, can associate with it immediately. And this is how he showed it to me. He said, how many times did you felt the urge to pray? Has anybody ever felt you want to pray? Hmm? Hmm? Not just go pray because you've got to pray. You felt like, I need to pray. And then you go like to church or to your room or to your couch or to your lounge, wherever. And then you go, you want to pray now. You're going to be very, you're going to kneel down and pray. And when you want to pray, there's nothing. But you felt the urge when you stopped your car to go pray. And now the only thing you feel is, oh, man. Oh, Jesus. And you think, I'm sure I felt I wanted to pray. Then you get up and you go do business. That was God trying to pray through you at that moment of time. And you missed the greatest prayer opportunity of your life because you wanted to pray with your intellect and God wanted to use your spirit to say, Oh, God. And God said, when you teach it, everybody can associate because I've put that burden on every single Christian. But because nobody teach it, nobody does it. How many times have you prayed? Oh, Father, today I pray for our schoolwork. I pray for my children. Lord, I pray for our car. I pray for this. I pray for that. And all of a sudden, there's nothing but, oh. Now, nobody's going to say, oh, because that's stupid. Now, my mind says, get up and go work. God says, just give me that oh, and see what I will do with you. Charles Finney shook the whole of North America by saying, oh God, every 20 minutes for eight hours a day, and God shook America with revival. Thank you.